Well, good morning again. I hope you're doing well. Um, let me ask you a question. Have you ever experienced something in life that you don't understand? A couple of you? Okay, once or twice? Have you ever experienced something in life that you don't understand? Maybe things like, God, why did this happen to me? Maybe, God, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Well, I, I want to take a time out from 1 Timothy. And I, I want to talk about something a little bit different. Um, Caleb, I'm not sure if this is going to work from up here. It, it's not letting me push the clicker. Well, hold on. Okay. Oh, don't look. Don't look. Oh! I don't know. So, have you ever experienced something in life that you don't understand? Y'all are distracted. I know. Y'all got it. Why? Yesterday was October 29, 2022. Candace and I celebrated 19 years since our car accident. I always have a hard time sharing in detail about the accident for several reasons. But this morning, I, I want to talk to you about God's grace in action. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the accident. I'm going to share how God's grace worked in our lives. Because I, I think this question, if you ever experience something in life that you don't understand, the Bible answers it, doesn't it? Sometimes we just don't like how the Bible answers it. But I, I think it's a, a question many people struggle with. Why? God, what are you doing? And it could be, it could be in the, you know, this week. God, what are you doing with our country? God, what are you doing with your state? God, why is my health falling apart? God, why did I fall? God, why this? Why that? Right? The list goes on, doesn't it? God, why didn't I get that job promotion? God, why don't my grandkids live closer? Or, God, why don't my grandkids live further away? I don't know. But the question of why? God, what are you doing? What are you doing? Let me ask you a question, though, because I think there's there's lots of application as I was working on this. How, how are you, how do you respond to events in your life that you don't like? How do you respond to events in your life that you don't understand? You know, I, I've seen and, and I've heard lots of people who say, yeah, I'm serious about God. And then when life gets difficult, they're done with God. They're done with God. It breaks my heart. I can think of a, a, a teen that I had a chance to pour my life into for a few years. And, and I loved him to death. I, I had a tendency to, to kind of, I don't know, be pulled to the difficult teens. And and uh, this kid, I, I, so why don't you come over? And he hated my guts. Oh, man, I loved him. But he hated my guts. He came over, and he wanted to jump on the trampoline, and we jumped, and we would play and, and have fun. And then he put me in a chokehold, and he, he actually tried to choke me out. And then he made a profession of faith as we talked and challenged him and loved him and things get difficult. He just kind of falls off the railroad tracks or the walk with Jesus. And I, I think in hard times, it's, it's, it's easy to say, God, why? What are you doing? What are you accomplishing? And so I want to share a little bit about the car accident. There's not enough time to go in great detail, but but I, I want you, I want to share what God has done in 
my life, our lives, it's not fair because I'm up here and Candace is down there, but I get to share. So you can ask her her side later. But I, I want to talk about the pre-accident. Before the accident, what was going on? Because um, before the accident, um, I've been pursuing full-time ministry since I was a junior in high school. And when I mean pursuing full-time ministry, when I was a junior, I started serving in the junior high ministry. I think Candace did too, shortly around there as well. We were involved in 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 um, discipling these young kids and loving them. I, I remember the first time that I taught, it was a, a, a seventh grade boys. And I've had to go back and ask the Lord to forgive me because I'm not sure what I was saying when I look at my notes. But I loved those kids. And we were pursuing full-time ministry if the accident happened in 2003. But in 2003, we both graduated from high school. It was a homeschool graduation. And we got done. And Candace went to Kansas for the summer to serve at a Bible camp. Pouring her life into the, the kids. And I went to, actually, I went to Delta, Colorado. And I was an intern for the summer at Grand Mesa Bible Church where uh, Mr. Tuck was uh, an elder at the time, and Eric Ellis was the pastor. Um, we were serving faithfully. And after my internship, after lots of joys and heartaches of, of interning here, learning that I wasn't as smart as I thought I was, uh, we went back to Texas. Candace came back. And we were serving in the church, in the ministry. Um, I didn't want to just be the the guy in front running the youth activities and, and uh, teaching and things like that. I wanted to understand every aspect of ministry. And so I said, can I please have the responsibility to unlock every building and lock up every building at the end? Because a lot of people just think those things happen magically. And they don't. And so. Um, I did that for quite, I can't remember how long, for a, for a while. But I, th I think it was, you know, we were serving the church faithfully. Um, we both were immersed in the scripture and theology. When I think I was a junior or a senior, I started going through um, systematic theology by Wayne Grudem with my father. We would meet every Thursday morning at 6 a.m. at, um, I don't know, someplace. But we were we were serving God. We were serving God. And so pre-accident, we talk about that's kind of what we look like. It was actually, uh, there was a costume party at church. We were supposed to be, uh, who was that? Sunny. Yeah, Sonny and Cher. Um, and so that was us before the accident. That was not my, my natural look. But uh, some of you may think you look better like that. I get it. But that was our, our pre-accident. And... Um, let's talk about the accident. We don't need to look at that anymore. The accident. Um, the accident was hard. So what happened? It was a Wednesday night. Uh, we went to col our college and career ministry. Um, and Candace and I had started dating. Um, I had, we, I, we went and I locked up all the buildings. Um, and I was like, hey, a bunch of our friends, believers, were going to Red Robin for dinner. And so I don't remember if you called or I called her mom and said, hey, can we go have dinner? These are the people who are going to be there. And, and her mom said, yeah, that'd be great. And so we went to dinner and it was taking a long time because there were like a lot of us there. So we were running late, and, and I, I called Candace's mom, Miss Kathy, and I said, we're running behind. Um, I can leave right now. She said, no, that's fine. Just finish, and when you're on your way home, just call me. And so that's what I did. We walked out of Red Robin. Um, this was when I was faster, and so I could actually open the door before Candace opened the door, you know, so I could get there fast enough, and I opened the door for her, and she got in, and I got in and we started driving to her house. I'd never driven to her house at night. And so we were driving. And she, you called your mom and said, we're on our way back. And she said, okay. And so we 
were going down the road. And um, we went through a construction area, I said 45 miles an hour. I was going 45 and I got down there and there was another main highway coming across the road. They had moved the road, but the stop sign was over 20 feet off the road. And I never saw the sign. And so I, in essence, ran the stop sign. And um, that's what happened. Um, I don't I don't like to go through this a lot because I don't like the attention on us. I want the attention on God. I want the attention on God. Because what what happened is is when I was going and they moved the road, I went across and got T-boned at 65. And the car went right between two poles. Um, and it was a barbed wire fence. There were three, I don't, I don't know what it's called, three strands of, of barbed wire. We cleared the top two and snapped the top, top one. That's how high we were. And I, I want you to understand how God was in control. Because when this stuff happened, um, it was a volunteer fire department who was first on the scene. Actually, there was a house on the corner here. We were out in the field over here, okay? Um, and when the husband and wife came out, they heard the accident. Uh, something like this happened. The husband said, I can't go to the car because there's no way they're alive. And I don't remember, but I think the wife said, we need to go check on them. The wife came out and said, they are breathing. And then it was a volunteer fire department that was first on the scene. Tell me there's no God when I tell you this. The car went end over end. It was a volunteer fire department that was first on the scene. The volunteer fire department just learned the week before how to use the jaws of life. If that's not God, I'm not sure what is. Because they got there and it was a I think a 13 year old boy who was trying to get me out. Now you want to talk about crazy when all of the accident happened and I'm not, I can't go into all the details, but the, there were two care flight helicopters that were on the scene. That's unheard of. That's unheard of, but they care flighted Candace. She had a brain hemorrhage and a cracked pelvis should have killed her on the spot. They said, if you would live, you'd be a vegetable the rest of your life. That's the best looking vegetable I've ever seen. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Um, and so then I, um, well, I'll show you. I'm, I'm sorry about the sound. I don't know what I did. Um, that they, that's where they use the jaws of life to cut off the roof. Um, that shows how far my my driver's side door was pushed in. Candace's right side of her head hit the window that she had the, the brain hemorrhage. Wow. wow, I don't know what I did. That just shows you how far it was pushed in. Oh, just got shot. Um, if you can see right there, you see where the, the red button is? That's the, the, I guess, the buckle for the seatbelt. My legs were pinned down underneath there. So my legs were pinned in there. Um, and then I was, my upper part of my body was laying over on top of Candace. Some people asked, was that because of the accident? Um, so God was, my legs were pinned there. They were working really hard to get them out from there. Um, the seat was folded over on top of me. Um, and so it was, it was a challenge. I was not the smallest individual. You see those spots on the airbag? Can you see them? I don't know if you can see that. The spot, that's all the external blood that I lost, just so you know. Um, I had a busted lip. That was about it. And then Candace, I don't know if I put it in, but she had a cut in her ear. And that was all of the external blood that she had lost. Um, and then that one just shows the picture, but we don't need to dwell on those things. So let's... Uh, just move on. But I wanted to show you those things. Um, before the accident, um, we both were in pretty good shape. Talk about life changing. Um, and I don't mean this, you know, Candace and I were, I think, the fastest two in the youth ministry at that time. And so all that was gone. Every piece of it was gone. 
And uh, there was lots of struggles. You know, I'll tell you just a, a, a little bit about the accident. Um, they, people ask me, do you remember what happened? I don't, I, you know, I don't think Candace remembers much at all from the accident. <laughs> Um, when we got hit and when they got out there, I had a few seconds. I was like, Lord, I, I know, I know you, things are not good. I, Lord, was my faith not real? Am I in hell? And I was out. Um, that's really the extent of my memory. Um, but I can tell you that whole day, what happened that day, that morning, I actually went to the store Academy to get new shoes with my mom. And I think it was this day we walked back there and, and we were going to look at shoes and there were some guys getting escorted out by some officers. And I started singing, what you going to do when they come for you, bad boy, bad boy. And my mom smacked me. Um, and so that was the start of my day. And, um, and so I, I do remember a lot of the day. Um, but talk about the struggle to understand. When the accident happened, um, they put me in an ambulance. Once they got me out of the car, they said my heart quit and I quit breathing five times. I love talking to people about reincarnation because the difference about them is they think it and I've tried it. And I've tried and every time I came back, the same person I was before. And um, talk about the struggle to understand what in the world was God doing. You know, my, my mother-in-law was concerned well, now mother-in-law was concerned when we didn't get home. She couldn't get a hold of my, couldn't get a hold of us. She actually drove up on the car accident. Um, and so talk about a tough deal for parents. Um, and she called, I don't remember who she called, but called my parents and they all headed down to the hospital. When they got to the hospital, they said, uh, we need you to identify the bodies. That's what they said. Um, talk about a heartache. Um, for parents, and that's for another time. But um, God was very gracious. Um, I, God, what are you doing? What are, what are you doing? I don't understand. We both were serving you. We had a relationship that was honoring to God. Um, we were discipling junior hires. What in the world? It was hard to cope with. We used to both run. We couldn't run anymore. It was gone. We could walk. Can't walk normal anymore. Wanted to give up. Wanted to give up over and over and over and over. So let's talk a, a little bit about the, uh, well, that was that was us after the accident. That was on a hospital visit where I got to go home. Um, and so. I was not anorexic at that time, um, but it was a tough, whoa, I skipped a whole bunch. I'm sorry, we're not done. Post-accident, that's where it need to be. So what happens after the accident? The struggle to understand why. Have you ever been there? Why do things happen in our lives? I, I didn't understand what God was doing. Guys, I, if I'm honest, and, and I, it was hard. You can talk to Candace. It was hard. Um, why? Why, God? Why would we do this? Why me? Why us? We loved you. We were living for you. We were being faithful to you. Now, I can't run. We can't run. We have five kids. We can't run with our kids. God, what in the world are you doing? Well, I struggled with it. As we sat in the, the hospital bed, I mean, we could talk about the coma for a while. I was in a coma 18 days. Candace was in one for five days. Um, God was gracious. Um, mine was a coma, but then mine was drug induced because of the severity of the injuries and the pain and all that kind of stuff. Um, I had to go, when we got to the hospital, they actually didn't know that I had a torn aorta. So when they were doing all the, the tests and everything and looking, they found out I had a torn aorta. They rushed me into heart surgery. It was seven hours, eight hours of surgery. And they told the families, they said, um, they said there's a hundred percent chance that he will die. They said that 50% die on the spot and the other 50% die within 24 hours guaranteed. <laughs> Look at that. I'm not dead last time I checked. Um, but it was hard. We laid in, in uh, the, the uh, coma. Um, my parents have told me stories, but whenever they would come in,
I didn't want to do this. My brother would come in. And every time there was a chance to be in the hospital, my brother would stay all night and he'd come in. You know what he would do? I wouldn't respond. But you know what he did every time he was in there? He read the Bible to me. Every single time. And I can't remember how far he said he made it. But he said, I think it was into the 70s or 80s of Psalms. And he would just read every time he could be in there. The funny thing was, is that when I was in the hospital, my left leg has been kind of crazy for a long time, but my left leg would bounce. So it would just fall off the bed. And so it became a pattern. Everybody would come in and they'd pick my leg up and they'd move it back over because there was no way I could get it back on the bed. And so then five minutes later, and they'd do it again. It was all night, all the time they'd be doing that. And so um, Candace had a brain hemorrhage, cracked pelvis. I had a Torn, torn, torn aorta, torn diaphragm, fractured femur, fractured pelvis, brain shear, spinal cord injury, yada, 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 yada. She had a bunch of similar stuff as well. Um, and so they did the heart surgery, but they wouldn't do the leg surgery because they said there's no reason to do the surgery on your leg because you're not going to live. And a few days into it, they're like, well, maybe he's going to pull through it, so we need to do the surgery. So they put a metal rod through my left femur. And so the struggle. The struggle to understand why, why God. As I sat in the hospital bed, um, I prayed numerous times, God, please take my life. I don't want to take another breath. I don't want to be here anymore. Why in the world would you do this, God? What are you trying to accomplish? Have you been there where you don't understand what God is doing? And y'all, it has taken me years to get there. And it is a daily process of dealing with these things. But I hope that I can bring encouragement to each of us. Because how do we struggle to understand why? Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 8. The hospital life was so hard. The hospital life was so difficult. I remember, you know, for Candace, they would come in and we had a wonderful nurse. I think we had the same nurse. It was, a, I don't remember her name. Um, but she was a... a um, I don't know where she was from. She was from India. She was so sweet, but she was so teeny tiny. She would come in and she would tell Candace, you got to eat your food. And Candace said, you eat it. Because it was nasty. It was nasty. We were on puree diets, which means that they would take your food and they'd run it through the blender and they would shape it into a magnificent looking steak. And you take your fork and your knife and you're like, <laughs> you're like really? Are you kidding me? And so, but this little lady, she would come and, and I, I, for me, I could not move at all. And so no joke, she had to be a bodybuilder, man. She came in, she picked me up like I was like a grocery sack empty. I don't know how she did it, but it was crazy, but everything was changed. The, the, the ability to do your own shower, the ability to walk to the bathroom, the ability to feed yourself, the ability to talk was gone. In the hospital, I, Candace couldn't talk for quite a while. She had to use a board to write things out. I had a paralyzed vocal cord. I couldn't talk. A lot of people probably rejoiced, but I couldn't talk, and it about drove me crazy. I was like, God, no. What are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? When the care flight took us to the hospital, they gave us wonderful names. What was your, na your hospital name? Candace was Oscar Wasp. That's what the care flight called her. And I was Kilo, Kilo, Quebec. I'm not sure what they were saying, but those were our names. But the hospital life was hard to understand why. I didn't understand. I remember the first time they would, they would say, here, here's some water, drink some water. Y'all, I forgot how to drink water. I had to ask, how do you drink water? I don't know. I don't know. If I was to ask you right now, how do you drink water? You might go, oh, it's simple. Question is, do you breathe or do you not breathe when you drink water? The answer is you don't breathe when you drink water. But I didn't know that. And so I would drink it and I'd hold it in my cheeks like a chip chipmunk. And that's how I did it. For weeks and weeks, it was very hard. They would put that nasty thicket stuff in there. So you're drinking like slime. It was weird. It was gross. What are they doing? I remember progressing through the hospital life. That going several weeks ahead, they took me down to physical therapy. It's physical torture. And I'm not kidding. It's physical torture. I went down there and they were like, Jake, you're going to walk. And I was like, I know I'm not like, yeah, you're going to walk. And they got two nurses on both sides of me and they manually moved one leg in front of the other leg. And I got nicknamed mushroom, butt. that's what they called me or marshmallow, marshmallow, butt. that's what they called me. That was my nickname in the hospital. And so I was known by a lot of people. We both were. 
but it was so hard. Why, God, why, why would you do this? We were serving you. The first time that, that Candace was always ahead of me. So they, they moved her from the hospital to another hospital for rehab and she was there. And then I got to come, but I would always come at the tail end of her stay. And that was the first time for her to come in and see me. And she came in and I looked like a werewolf. It was bad and like I look it was terrible. And she came in and they they pushed her in and they're like, quick, we'll let you guys talk. And we just stared at each other. This is weird, right? It was hard. It was so hard. The struggle to understand why, God, what are you trying to accomplish? Fast forwarding through the accident, there was a chance where I would get day passes. I felt like I was getting out of jail, but they would give me a day pass to leave the hospital and my parents would take me and we would go do something. And Candace was, was part of a choir and they were at Six Flags. Um, the choir was singing there. And so we were going to go have dinner and I was ecstatic to have real food. And so I was in a wheelchair and we went and we picked up Candace from Six Flags. We went over to a place called Grandy's and we went into Grandy's and I was in a wheelchair and they pushed me in there. And I, I w had an episode where I, I went to the bathroom and was getting ready to come back and I started shaking. And I was shaking so bad that I fell over. And so they picked me up, put me in the wheelchair. And we left. And so I left. It was Candace and my brother and like one other person. And my mom and dad and I were rushing to the hospital. As I was sitting in the passenger seat, my father, he held his hand across my chest to hold me back because I was shaking uncontrollably. I couldn't stay put. Why God? Why God? Right? Have you ever been there? What is God accomplishing? Well, Romans 8 tells us. Look at what it says. You should be there. Romans 8, 28, he says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. I was like, time out, God, we got a problem. God, we got a big problem because this ain't good in my life. I don't know what the heck you're talking about. I know your Bible is true. I know what you say is true. But God, I don't understand. This is not right from my perspective. He goes on and he says, to those who are called, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the first. So he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Isn't that great? He says all things work together for good. And over the time, as I begin to understand the word of God, good is when I become like Jesus. That's what good is. And I said, God, I don't understand. I don't like this. I don't understand it. God, I want to die. I want to be with you because it makes no sense to me. I don't understand. And it has been a battle for the past 19 years. You know, this doesn't go away. This never goes away. There are always struggles, right? Because we have an enemy that works to bring these things up in our minds all the time. That's why the Bible says, take every thought captive, right? That's what the Bible says, set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. When I'm sitting here and I was laying in the hospital bed going, God, why? Why me? I had so many great friends. We both had so many good friends. They would come and they would stay in the hospital with us. And I remember one of my really, really good friends. I'm trying to get him to come here. His name's Ernie Black. He's in his 60s. But, but he, was, he had such an impact in my life. So, so I get so frustrated in the hospital. Have you all ever laid in the hospital bed? Anybody? Miss Pat, you were, right? We can talk. It's not very comfortable, is it? It's uncomfortable. And you lay there. And I was there 49 days, 49 days in a hospital bed. I was about to just be to go crazy. I was laying there and my friend Ernie came and he stayed the night and he said, Jake, what can I do to help you? And no joke, Ernie, my friend, he jumped into my bed. He sprawled out of my bed so that I could lay on my side because every time I got on my side, I'd fall back over. And Ernie's laying there and he goes, Jake, I don't think the nurse is going to think this is very good. But he tried anything he could to help in the midst of ugliness, in the midst of hard times. But what was God trying to accomplish? Okay, so I understand that all things work together for good. And good is when I become like Jesus. We're talking about those who are believers. But I struggle with verses like Proverbs 3, 5. You all know this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. 
Well, that's easy to do when things are going the way that we want them to go, right? But when things are going the way that you don't want or you don't understand, when everything that you could do was taken away, like this was on Wednesday, that Saturday, that Friday and Saturday, I was going to rodeo clown school. I was going to be a rodeo clown and I had a whole plan. I was going to be a rodeo clown. I would be in good shape. I would stay fit. I could get free tickets. I could invite the teens to come watch their youth pastor run around like a chicken with his head cut off. It's a win for everybody. And then I was like, Lord, if I can do this, I can be involved in Bible studies on Sundays with the Cowboys and, and talk to them about the gospel. And every bit of that was ripped away. God, what are you doing? It doesn't matter what it is that you're struggling with. God, what are you doing in my marriage? What are you doing with my relationship with my kids? What are you doing with my health? The question of why oftentimes comes up. And I think we need to be able to handle it biblically. I won't stand up here and say, I did it right. I stand up here saying, I royally messed up. I wanted to take my life. I wanted my life over. I didn't like what God had done. I didn't like the cards that God had dealt with me. I was frustrated. I was like, God, I was going to, I was on a plan. I had the prayer, Lord, I don't want to be a big name, but God, I want to get as many people that were in the stadium. Like when Billy Graham spoke, I want that many people to hear about God. Why did you take it away from me? Why? And all I could do, they took the Lord breaking me of my pride. When I got out of the hospital, I remember my father said, Jake, you need to drive. They had to physically pick me up and put me in a car because I would never get in a car again. There were things that my family did for me because I was going to give up on life. When I got out or as soon as I could, my dad would and parents, they would come up with the money to fly me to, to California to stay with a friend, Chris Reiser, to learn, about myster, uh, to learn about mystery or ministry, not mystery, ministry. And then I would go to Bakersfield to stay with Brian Murphy. And then I would go to Delta to stay with Eric Ellis. And then I went to Georgia to stay with another guy because they didn't want me to give up in ministry. And I wanted to. God, I, what are you trying to do? And so if you're there not understanding what God's doing in your life, your health is failing, whatever it is, your marriage is failing, your kids are, are being rebellious and they're not submitting to their parents, the list goes on. But whatever the reason is, I want you to understand what God says. God says that all things work together for good to those who love him. And the good that he's talking about is when you become like Jesus Christ. But I had to understand the process. Like in 1 Corinthians, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I love what he says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's talking to believers, the church at Corinth. They have some, some their theology was off a little bit. And Paul would write and he would say, look, you're wrong here, but I love you. This is the correct thinking. But in verse 13, he says, no temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So I had to get my mind wrapped around the fact that God is never going to put us in a situation where you have to sin. Never, ever will God do that. And then go to James chapter 1, verse 2. Oh man, Hebrews jumped out of my Bible. There it is. All right, James chapter chapter one. He says in verse one, James, the bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who were dispersed abroad greetings. So stop there. He's talking to believers who are scattered out, right? 12 tribes are scattered out. Then he says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing, verse three, that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Verse 5, but if any, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives you all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. So I, I came to grips with understanding that, that God, 
would never put me in a situation that, that forces us to sin. So I had to change my perspective on life of saying, God, why? Thank you, God, that you counted me worthy to go through this trial. Thank you. Because he allows us to go through these trials. It's kind of like you're saying, okay, God, put me in. He's not going to make me sin, but God says you're, you're ready to go through this trial. And so you say, okay, coach, I'm ready. My God is my coach. God, put me into the game. I'm ready to suffer. I'm ready to go through this trial. So I had to start taking every thought captive. I had the, the struggle of understanding why. I had to understand that this was part of God's perfect plan. And I, I struggle with it to this day, if I'm honest. I do, because I want to run. I want to run with my kids. I want to run with the teens. I want to run all over screaming about Jesus. But God has said, not yet, not yet. So we have to understand that, that God allows us to go through these things to, to purify us, right? To cause us to grow in our walk with Christ. You see, we have a God that's in the business of refining us, isn't he? The Christian life is so great, but the Christian life is so hard, isn't it? Because God's going to refine us. And the process of gold and silver being refined is it is heated up so hot to bring the, the filth to the surface, the, the impurities, the dross. Well, the same happens to God's children, right? God's, God puts us through these trials. He's not going to tempt us beyond what we're able. We don't have to sin. Oftentimes, I do, if I'm honest. But he puts us through these trials to, to bring the, the impurities, the sin, to the surface. For me, it was Jake. Quit getting upset at God about the accident. Trust God. Know that God's plan is best. And I had to go, Lord, help me take off the impurities of not trusting you. I'm sorry. The struggle of, of keeping the focus. See, we have an enemy that prowls around like a roar, roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Going back, remember I said I want to run, right? One of the things that's really hard for me is Apple Fest because I want to run up and down the street all day from the time they get here to the time they stop passing out gospel tracts, right? Guess what? I can't do that. Satan uses that to get my focus off of God, right? He uses that to get me to, well, you shouldn't even try to put out one track then because you can't run. Isn't that how Satan works? That's exactly how Satan works. To get our focus off of Jesus. So there were some really nice people who gave me an electric scooter. Now I can cruise up and down those streets and get those gospel tracks out. The struggle of keeping the focus, that's why we have Hebrews 12. If you just turn to the left a couple of pages or one page, it says in verse 1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here it is. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, we have to continually fix our eyes on Jesus. That's the continual process. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I don't have time to get into it, but the minds are a powerful thing, aren't they? Our minds can get us so distracted. And that's why we've got to take every thought captive. The struggle of contentment being satisfied has been hard. If I'm honest, and I told you that I had, I had a half a million dollars in medical bills, and I don't know how much Candace had, but I know because I was in driving my our insurance helped cover the cost and all that kind of stuff. But you talk about the hand of God. My dad was moving us insurance plans from one to another. 
And for three days, I was double covered. You know what three days that was? The 29th and the 30th. When we maxed out one insurance policy and another kicked in. That's God. The struggle of contentment. How do you deal with it? Well, that's why we have Colossians in the Bible. Colossians 3 verse 2. I love what he says. Set your mind on the things above. How do you do that? You immerse yourself in the word of God. You memorize the word of God. You meditate on the word of God. That's why we have the spiritual disciplines. These things don't happen naturally. You have to work hard. Every believer has to work hard to do these things. So what? What does this mean? I don't really know. That's us. I already showed you that. That's us after the car accident. I know it's small, but that was us after the car accident. It, it, it was a tough road. It is a tough road. It still is a tough road. But God was good, and God was gracious. But that was at one of our, uh, one of my hospitals. Wasn't that one of my, one of my outings I got from the hospital? I think. But hospital life was hard. I could tell you story after story. I was at the hospital. They, they, they wanted me to, they were trying to make sure that I wouldn't give up on life. And I could give them some recommendations, but I'm no doctor. So, so you know, they, they have these tables that they use for physical torture. And they gave me a, a fitted sheet and they wanted me to make it like a bed. And I was like, no, no. And so like I fumbled all around and I struggled to walk around and I struggled and I would try to do it. And they took me to this room set up like a kitchen and they wanted me to make microwave popcorn. And I, y'all, I burned the popcorn. Every person in the hospital knew Jake Wyatt because I knew how to burn popcorn. It was hard. I wanted to give up. So what? So what, what does this mean for us? What is, what is the application? I, I don't say these things because Candace and I want sympathy. We don't. We would go back and go through it again. We would do it again in a heartbeat because the Lord has been faithful. The Lord has refined me, uh, has refined us in ways that are unbelievable from my perspective. So what? What does this mean? Let me leave you with the same question I asked you at the beginning. How are you responding to the events in your life that you don't like or you don't understand? Sorry. Um, how are you responding? Because we all have them, don't we? We all have them. Well, let me share two verses. Listen to this in 1 Peter chapter 1. He was talking to, to believers who were experiencing immense persecution. He said, in this you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you're a believer and you know Christ, I pray that as you have events that happen in your life, you don't understand um, health failing, whatever the struggles are, realize that the God's refining you. God's refining you. He says, you're ready to go through this trial. And, and, and he wants you to become conformed to the image of Jesus. I found this interesting. Listen to what Malachi 3 says. In verse 2, it says, who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fueler's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. You see, when difficulties come, when things come that you don't understand, understand that God is not spinning out of control. Understand that God is just refining you. God is just refining you and, and he wants to maybe realize areas. If you're a believer, he wants to, 
to bring the sin in your life and say, man, you, you're not trusting God. You're trusting yourself or material possessions. And, and God's trying to get your attention and say, you need to set your mind on things above. That's for the believer. If you're here and, and you don't know Christ, I, I'll just tell you. In James 4, it says life is a vapor. Y'all, when this happened, I was invincible, I thought. I was 18. I thought, we th- at least I thought, I won't speak for Candace. I thought I could take over the world. And God said, let me humble you. He went to extreme, member, uh, extreme measures to humble me. But your next breath is not a guarantee. My next breath is not a guarantee. And I think that should do a couple of things. One, for those of you who don't know Christ, or maybe you're just being kind of lazy in your walk with Jesus. I think one that should make you evaluate where you're at with God because your next breath is not a guarantee. Understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But when I hear that as a believer, that life is not a guarantee, you know what that does to me? We got to get up on the housetops and scream about our God. We need to get every person in Cedar Edge, Delta County, and abroad to hear about who God is. Because the God that we love and the God that we serve is a God that will save anybody if they repent of their sins and come to Jesus. If you're here and you don't know Christ, I pray that you come to understand that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you're here and, and maybe you're, you're struggling understanding what God's doing in your life, talk to somebody around you. You can talk to me, but for somebody around you, it's fine. We will pray with you. We'll help you. We'll encourage you. But if you don't know Christ, don't wait because now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that you're a good God. God, I'm thankful that you're in control even when we don't understand events in our lives. Father, I'm thankful for the grace that you've shown us in our lives. Father, I'm thankful for the car accident. Father, I pray that you continue to use it for your glory. And Father, I know there's many here and Lord, probably several who have events happen where they don't understand what's happening. But Lord, may may they have a biblical perspective that all things work together for good to those who love God. And good is when we become conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. And Father, if there's one here who's never placed their faith in Christ, I pray they come to understand the seriousness of sin. May they come to understand that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I pray that they understand that now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Father, we thank you for our time. I pray that you be honored and glorified in Christ's name. Amen.